Hello and welcome to the newest episode of Before They Knew Better, the podcast from DIY Magazine. My name's Lisa Wright. Here's my co-host and producer, Giles Bidder. <laughs> oh no, he can't say it. <laughs> I'm in the library. <laughs> well, he would be. He's in the library. Giles is in the library today, which means that he has been a mute man, um, which also means that today's conversation with our guest is just me. Sorry, guys. If anyone's a fan of Giles's interjections, then you ain't getting none of those today. However, there is more than enough joy to be had from our guest. It is Serge Pizzorno of Kasabian. Um, I feel like Serge at this point doesn't really need an introduction. Kasabian have been like pretty tall top tier festival headlining British rock band for the last 20 years almost. Um, They have got a new album coming out. It is called Happenings. It is out in July and it is going to coincide with another festival headline at Latitude alongside this sort of uh, second coming of their huge hometown Leicester show at Victoria Park. They did one about a decade ago. This is round two. It is going to be inevitably massive again. Um, We are surged to bring in, as we do with all all of our guests, an object, a photo, and a song from his childhood, teenage years. And Serge stretched it a little bit, and it was sort of like his early 20s in the beginning of the band, but I feel like we'll let him have that. Um, he is just genuinely a true one off character who uh, is just both very funny, but also quite wise sometimes. And all of his choices and stories were just as ridiculous as you would probably expect from a man who has made a sort of career out of being like secret like i feel like they're kind of one of the most like uh bombastic in their own mad way bands around like you don't get many 40 something year old front men uh who turn up wearing like big fluffy coat uh mad stuff one time i went to see them and he was wearing three watches for reasons that he never fully explained um and i feel like that sort of thing is just there's a twinkle in the eye of serge pizzorno and it was fully uh coming into play during today's chat so yes uh give kasabian's album a pre-order and carry on and get stuck into our newest episode of Before They Knew Better with DIY Magazine and Serge from Kasabian. So yeah, I mean, we're talking about uh, this Leicester gig which is coming up and I feel like you of all bands are like someone where the hometown is still the town that you live in, is still the place that has always been such like a pivotal part of everything with Kasabian, which obviously goes back nicely to us talking about your formative memories there. Like, is Leicester just like, could you ever imagine yourself living anywhere else? No, no. I mean, it's funny because there are times where I, you know, where it's, it's sort of pissing it down and there's nowhere to go. And you do think to yourself, what, like, surely there's more, <laughs> surely there's more <laughs> out there. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, um, but then uh, my family is so important to me and my pals and, you know, like just now, now the studio, I've always had studios at home and I've always found it. Songwriting just what works for me in, in Leicester. And I've, you know, I sort of tend to travel a lot and then I feel like I sort of form the ideas away, grab a little bits of inspiration and then I sort of need to bring them home, you know, and, and that's kind of where I always feel comfortable writing and that's where I've sort of written everything. So I think it has a lot to do with that, really. I, I think, you know, songwriting for me is everything, my life. So it's it's almost like I need to nurture that part of myself, you know, it's like, mm. well, it works here, so that's... If it works here, that's kind of where I need to be, you know? Yeah. Do you think it's something about the environment or like the sort of people or the weather or whatever it is <laughs> about that I, city that's like that yeah. works for you? I suppose there's an element of outsider, the underdog. Um, I think there's just, yeah, I, I, that that to me, I, I just, there's nothing sort of special about the place, which which I love, you know, like, it's just an ordinary town in in the in the middle of England, sort of. But then there's so much like 
vibrant culture. Like it's a it's a weird place, and their sense of humor is so dark and so like. It's just pure piss take, really. Like, you can't take anything <laughs> seriously. You can't take yourself seriously. You can't get ahead of yourself. You can't, you can't, I don't know. You, but you sort of can big yourself up, but then there has to be a sort of sense of humour behind it or, or I don't know, or, or, or so, you know, there's something to do with the whole place that I just find the magic. There's magic in there. And I think, you know, I sort of feel like, it's probably similar to look similar to a lot of places, you know, in, 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 in Britain and on all over really. Cause the songs that I've written here have connected with people in Buenos Aires and, mm. and Tokyo. And, and so it's not as if it's, you know, it, it ha there's, there's, a, there's something about it that that's, that's for everyone really. Yeah. I guess it's like, um, yeah, Le Leicester is Leicester is everywhere and and nowhere. And it's my it's, it's it's, it's Ken if Kendrick has got Compton, then I've got Leicester. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you? So, am I right in thinking that um, you were born ever so slightly out or like in Devon secretly? But then yeah, moved. it's a weird place. It's a weird story. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, because I feel like you're so synonymous with that that when I read Devon, I was like, "Hold on, what?" Like, yeah. I have been no, it's fed a, really, a lie. It's a, it's a weird story because my my mom loved this hospital. She spent a lot of time down Devon, uh, and she just liked this place, quiet little place. And mm -hmm. I think I spent I spent all of two days in, in a place called Newton Abbott. I spent two days there and then I was taken home in a car by a, a cardboard box. It was before the <laughs> days of like, you know, like, oh, you need chairs. When I had my kids, man, you needed like health and safety to check the car. And you know what I'm saying? It was like the, you need seat, the correct seats, seat belts. And it was a real sort of stringent thing, man. I think I went home in a five slight little banana box, cardboard box, man. You know what I'm saying? Like just on okay. the front seat. Dad yeah. took me home. And that, that was it. So that's the, the, the only time I've ever been. But someone told me that I'm in the museum down there. That that's like one of the people, one of the sort of, you know, <laughs> they've not, I don't think they have a big pool of people that, that to, to draw from, but you know, so yeah, just that a is a, that is a strange a one. Baby yeah. in a banana box, just framed <laughs> exactly. in the middle of Newton. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I love the what? idea. At Christmas, they don't show, they don't, they don't do the baby Jesus. They do me, you know, you know. <laughs> box. beautiful just hastily making his exit forevermore <laughs> um, exactly what do you think so i mean that was um a mother's choice thing however yeah. i feel like where does the italian side of you come from that's my so my my dad um my my, my granddad is from genova um mm. and my dad it's very, it's, Italy's very, very important to him. So I was, so I was brought up very much sort of like embracing that, the Italian culture, the Italian way. My dad, I feel like he wanted sort of, my granddad died when I was only two, but I feel like he wanted to kind of keep that alive in, in me and then for me to pass it down to my kids, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and, and obviously having a very Italian name, you know, it, it, it sort of, it, it made sense. It wasn't like, oh, this is weird. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So I, so I, I felt, um, you know, and I, th I th you know, he was, he was very much into football and stuff. So, so like the Italian national team became, it's almost, I thought about it the other day, it sort of became more, it has, it's so much, it's so much deeper than football team. Like, my, like the, the, the national team represents, I don't like the connection between me and my, my dad's family and that's very important to him. So it's been passed through me, you know, mm. and, and I feel, yeah, I, I feel it's sort of, it gave me an interesting start, which is definitely sort of had an effect on what I did with my life, I think, or where I wanted to go. I've always felt a little bit on the outside, not in a bad way though. I'm very comfortable there, you know what I mean? But I think it, you definitely are, instantly different you know uh, especially yeah. in a time when schools no one was called like no one was called strange name when i was a kid 
Now, now it's very different. Now, now there's, there's very, you, you know, there's some wild names at school now. So everyone's cool with that. But when I was a kid, you were instantly singled out. And it's like you had to kind of figure out how you were going to deal with that, you know, very quickly. Yeah. Did you sort of embrace it as like a sort of point of difference? Or like, were you always a kid that was kind of happy, like, being a little bit kind of uh, away from the mainstream or the crowd? There were definitely times when I was younger, too, like really young, like, you know, when I, when I, why don't you just call me Philip, you know, or <laughs> Craig, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> What's this? <laughs> why have I got a weird name? But then, you know, when I sort of grew, grew older, you know, got to 10, 11, I, I don't know, I sort of loved it. I think it, I, I, I loved sort of wearing it like, the, like an Italian shirt to school and I, I sort of buzzed off the kind of the little bit of spikiness that it would attract mm-hmm. and and I liked you know I liked the the fashion and the I don't know it just felt it felt like I suppose what that feeling of joining a band gives you like um maybe a sense of belonging but not necessarily to what you're supposed to belong to like you know like and I think a band has a similar effect where you just feel like, you know, you go, you're attracted to the wildest clothes and go, oh, no, I'm wearing that, you know, mm-hmm. like, why? It's like everyone's going to destroy you at school. Are you going to get battered? It's like, yeah, I know, but that's the fucking best bit about it, you know, the, the sense that I could get smashed with this, you know, like, but then it's like, <laughs> oh, I'm going to, I can't, I can't not now. I've, I've thought it in my head, you know. <laughs> would that ever happen did you ever have like the sort of you know getting like uh mocked by the sort of kids on the bus because you had like a guitar and like a weird jacket or anything oh god yeah yeah that was part of the course you know it started <laughs> started with the it started when i was young young with the name you know what i mean like take them taking a piss and you know some awful like you know pizza jokes and shit you know like just the shit you expect but then when the when the um the music thing came and the sort of that came with the long hair and the, you know, uh, then, then it started to get, you sort of Shane Meadows, you know, like you, mm-hmm. you Shane Meadows standard sort of Midlands town, some awful two or three year older, like local bullies, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That would just, you know, like that would can try and put cigarettes out on you and shit on the park. Oh you know, those God. sort of, you know, those sort of wrong that would like, we're doing like, you know, just na- nasty sort of proper into the heavy into drugs and just that would just sort of mill around the park. So you'd have to navigate that. But then I think that, you know, I think that after when, you know, after that, you don't really, you know, a few trolls here and there can't really affect you. You know what I mean? You're like, well, it's not, you know, it's like, and then you start to see when you get older, like those people are, just feel sorry for them, you know. What I'm yeah. <laughs> but at the, t- I mean, at the time, at the time, and you know what? What really helped me was being good at football. That was kind mm-hmm. of, you know, I think that that helps helps a kid through uh, school. Uh, it gives you a nice, easy ride if you're good at football. And, and and thankfully, you know, I was pretty good, so. I was pretty much left alone because it's like, oh, he's good at football. You know what I'm saying? Every yeah, now and again, you'd I mean, have to avoid a crazy tackle, you know, but, but, but it was pretty much like, oh, he's one of, you know, he's, he's kind of, he's good at football. We'll leave him alone sort of thing. He gets a pass. Before we talk about football though, when you're saying uh, with the long hair, fa- I mean, like how long, like what's the most ridiculous haircut that we're talking no, about back in it, those times? It was, it was probably, it was kind of like that, it was quite beetly. It was. I mean, I was. I was the perfect age. I mean, the the mu- the start of the musical journey, man, was more the rave scene, <laughs> which I've spoke about quite heavily. But that was definitely like the first time I really embraced, and I knew, like, you know, I got a a sampler, and a, and a, and in in back in the day, to find some musical instruments that were a bit more obscure you'd go in the classified. So in the Leicester Mercury, like the local paper, you would, there's no, there was no, there was no eBay, man. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was fucking like, you had to look for like, uh, there's a specific computer called Atari 500, which had a, uh, a program called Octomed. And there was one, yeah, Octomed, that was the thing to find, but it was really hard. They were, 
rocket you know it was really difficult to find <laughs> but then the classifiers one came up got that and then got a sample and that was kind of like i would make i was making sort of trying to make you know hardcore basically mm. but i was only 12 13 so I, so I, I realized then it's like oh like production is bit is where my, i started like i started to produce songs and make songs before i knew what chords were before i knew how to play guitar or piano or anything like that so mm-hmm. the production side of things was was where i started that was kind of my right i want to make songs and i you know and i i had old beatles records and rave records and i try and sort of m- make them sound as if they were you know i tried to make them work together hardcore beatles happy hardcore I yes yes exactly i mean that was yeah i mean the sergeant <laughs> pepper's the album i had and i just tried to sort of blend them two together did it um, work did it sound good no it was it, i i didn't know what i was doing i it, basically it was it was sped up i mean it's 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 quite the thing now, isn't it, to speed up music? So like I was like I was way game. ahead of the curve there, you know what I'm saying? There was <laughs> there was like Chipmunk Beatles going on with some like some heavy happy hardcore, but yeah. So that was that, and then then obviously I was the prime age for the for, for Britpop, and um, that's when you know like dress right, sort of dressing like Keith Richards and Jim Morrison and growing the hair and stuff was the thing. I mean, the photo that you have brought in is, I'm going to guess, sort of around that age. Mm. Um, how old do you yeah. reckon you are in this picture? I think I think it's probably about, maybe about 17, something like that. Okay, it's yeah. double denim. Double denim's a risky double move, denim. even back then. <laughs> I was thinking I George like- Harrison. I, I was thinking George Harrison, but... I- I don't know. The fit wasn't quite right, but you don't know what you're doing then, right? You don't know yeah, about. You were just testing and... it out, yeah. yeah. Were you always like yeah. a fashion? Like, did you care a lot about fashion even as a teenager? Yeah, yeah. It's been a been a big part. Yeah, mom, mom was always heavily into it, and I, I um, you know, I, that was something I, I really like enjoyed doing. It. There wasn't many things I enjoyed doing at school, but that was one of them. That was like a, you know, I I loved, I loved clothes. I loved um. I love the icons as well. I love, you know, I love how, you know, outfits from movies and, and, and from bands and stuff, they were just, you know, I was obsessed really. Like when I get into something, I go, it, it, it's a blessing and a curse, but the obsession goes pretty, pretty heavy. <laughs> so, you know, so I was definitely trying that. I I think it was almost, I would say like, the, like a George Harrison double denim thing, or even like, you know, sort of a member of a, sort of you know american 70s court or something you know they like that double denim gear (laughs) (laughs) i don't think i've ever known anyone reference cult leaders as a fashion sort of it's it's that 70s it's that like sort of you know it's that late 60s early 70s thing well you know what they had to look pretty good otherwise they wouldn't have got all of those people exactly so fair fair enough Where would you go? Would you be someone who was like, would you like trawl the charity shops of Leicester or were you like sort yeah. of find it? What would be your, your way? So into I, that? Yeah. Yeah. The, the charity shops around that sort of time, charity shops and, and the early years of the band charity shops were high in the high stakes. Like they were like the, the camp camp, the, the sort of trip down to Camden market was like gold, but you know what? I loved like, I like a little TK Maxx zone as well. Like Ooh. TK Maxx was quite a big, and you know what I mean, they were like you could find some absolute gems, man. You could go in there and get, you could get some like wild Versace or like even like some <laughs> old Gucci that was no like the, the things I liked were the things no one wanted. You know what I'm saying? So that that shop in particular would would knock out like you'd get some big furs from there, and they would you know, and they were from like you know like the top end brands to be like so that was always worth going but i worked in a clothes shop when i was 19 um and it was like you know when like that time the high street was like it was it was like prop like that shop was amazing it was called pilot and mm. and um it sold like it sold the gear you know what i'm saying and then you'd get you you would get 50 percent off so you wage, you'd net no, you'd net no money at the end of the week. So you could go, oh, I had that and I had that and that. Oh, I did get that as well. You know what I mean? So, so, so my wardrobe was pretty tight back then. 
Can you remember the first? Because I feel like as as long as I've been watching you, you've always kind of kind of pushed the boat out in terms of clothes. As in, like there's been some wild. There was the skeleton era mm. um, last time that I saw you when we did that chat. You had the most bombastic sort of like multicolored floor length fur coat that I've seen in a while. Like, how <laughs> do you? Can you remember the first time that you like wore something that was a bit wild and had to be like, okay, I'm just going to own this. Like, I'm. Gonna to be this guy now that that walks down the road in like a floor length fur yeah i think like uh, back 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 when like i'm there was a moment in a school nativity and i would have been god you i don't know when this is school nativity i think you're about eight nine yeah, right, right. Something like yeah something like that and uh so i was one of the shepherds and the the shepherds come out and you know, you got that, it was like a curtain thing, you know, like it's like the thing you're supposed to wear, you know, everyone wore mm. the curtain. And the, and two lads came out in front of me, and then I came out behind. And I had my cl- like, I had my normal clothes on. And my mum was really upset. She's oh, they must have run out of costumes, you know, like, oh, it's, you know, what a shame. And then after mm. the thing, mum went to the teacher, said, oh, you know, what's that all about? And she said, oh, no, 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 he just wouldn't wear. <laughs> The curtain, mate, he just re- plainly <laughs> refused. Like he said, I'm not wearing that. So I was like, I'm sure that is like the first time when I'm going, mm, yeah, no, I've got an opinion on this and it's, 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 it's strong enough to not wear what you're telling me to wear <laughs> in the school place. So that was there, rooted for sure. But I think, yeah, I think like definitely around the sort of 95, 96, um, with, with the time where I was like, yeah, I, I'm done with wearing sort of track suits and stuff and, you know, and the sort of baggy rave gear. I was, I, I went hard on that, like the, the sort of, you know, like the really super baggy jeans and the, yeah. the kind of what, what, what sort of came back in like a few years back, long sleeve t-shirts with the sort of rave slogans, you know what I mean? Like it would have mm-hmm. been like, you know, just, Fairly, rather than fairly liquid, it's like fairly hip kid, just add LSD, shit like that. You know, <laughs> stuff you don't want your kids in. You know what I mean? So that was that. And then I think like 94, 90, yeah, 95, 96, I would, that would have been like, you know, the sort of rock and roll circus where I would be trying to look for big furs. and then, yeah. But then cross between a very sort of terrorist look as well. Like I would also, I wouldn't just commit to going, Oh, I'm this now. I would definitely every now and again drop a Stone Island jacket or a, you know, like a L- Lacoste hoodie or or, or, or a tra- so I would I would go into both camps. Pretty, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So I wouldn't I wouldn't not because just just because, but I I I I, I do enjoy both. I can't just commit to one thing. I can't do it. Like I can't. I don't see the world that way. I have to sort of go. Well, I like that as well. So I'm going to go there as well. You know? Yeah, but I guess you were sort of straddling both worlds back then anyway, mm. because like there was, yeah, of course. I mean, was the sort of, um, was the time when you were sort of uh, gearing up to be, I mean, you were basically going to be a footballer, right? Like in a way that seemed yeah. more yes. realistic, you know, I know a lot of kids go, oh, I want to be a footballer, but it felt, but I feel like you actually were on course to genuinely do that, right? Yeah, yeah, that was, so 13, 14 I got released at 14. So yeah, up until that point, that was definitely like, I had the music thing, but it was way, it was way more of a, just something that I enjoyed doing. It wasn't like, oh, I can, you know, this is, this is, you know, what I want to do the rest of my life. It was more like, oh, I'm into this. Mm-hmm. But football was definitely like, was everything. And then it just wasn't, it was quite quick actually. Like, I don't know. I just sort of realized, I don't know. I felt, yeah, I think I probably got bored of it pretty quickly and then it just wasn't enough. Um, and then, yeah, I just, just lost lost interest in, in wanting to do that. And then sort of 15, 16, then music just became, right, that is it. Because at that age, you're sort of looking for, you don't really have a clue what, what there is out there. And what was on offer was shop fitting, uh, yeah, um, labouring. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's mm-hmm. not. It's not like this. And oh man, you can be a stagehand in a you know, West End theatre. Like what the fuck, man? Yeah, I'll do that. That sounds amazing. But no one's saying that. 
Mm. It's very much a printer. You know what I'm saying? You've got these very basic things. Um, and then that whole wave of Britain being sort of the centre of fashion and music and for a very short time, it it sort of really injected this like confidence and in, into someone that was looking for like guidance, you know, like what the fuck? I don't want a normal job. I don't, that sounds shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, I need to do something. And then it's like, oh, you can be in a band and look at these people. These are like wild and there was no rules and they just seemed like, I was like, and I love writing. So it all just sort of fell into place, I think. And that, I don't know, that confidence that came from those people sh with confidence. It wasn't like something you sort of manifested. It wasn't a real confidence. Like you stood there and think, oh, yeah, we're going to take over the world. You know, all that bullshit. But mm -hmm. at the time when you're that young, fuck, it's powerful. And you know what? To get out of a situation, get out of a, a normal town m with a normal life set out for you, you know, having that like, confidence and the attitude to just go fuck everyone we are going for this man and like get the fuck out of the way is powerful you've just got to know there's an age or time when you have to turn that off you know <laughs> gotta keep that going it's not good but <laughs> i tell you what at the time it, there's nothing that energy and that fuel man is fucking powerful do you think that did come from like, I mean, obviously, you know, your sort of uh, relationship with Oasis has been spoken about loads, but like, you know, coming from a northern town, them being very working class sort of heroes, you know, that whole thing of like, you don't have to be born from loads of money and from like privilege and you can just like fucking go for it. Like you say, was, mm. was that a big catalyst for kind of feeling like you could do it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, no songwriting and that period was, I mean, you know, like the best there, there, there was, you know, it was un, untouchable. And Liam's like attitude and performance, you know what I mean? Like he just, and he just sort of, he had a plan, Liam. You just looked at him and he just went, yeah, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. And, I, you know, that's like, you follow that, you know, and I, and, and I think what, like especially like you know like that lg thing of like just he is him and he does he's just in there and he looks unbelievable and he, he sort of fits into that icon but then he's sort of funny manchester swagger but that but i always knew like I, you can't recreate that and i saw most kids around our way and all the people we played with um you know, at that time, starting out, we're just trying to be Liam. And I was like, no, nah, you're getting it wrong. Like, he's not telling you to be him. He's fucking telling you to be you. Like, and and that is what's so, like, that's what's amazing about him. Cause it's, and I was like, so I'm just going to fucking go, right, that's it. He's, if, if he taught me anything, it's like, like, I don't give a fuck. And that is, that is, you know, that's how I'm going to roll this. I'm going to turn up and you're not going to like it, but that's the point, you know what I mean? <laughs> was that the attitude even from like the first sort of Kasabian gigs? Was it always very kind of like, right, okay, we're going to, we're, we're going to do this. Like we're going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. It had to be like, I, I it had to be, I don't, I, you know, I, it, it, it had to be all or nothing. And I was, I think because, you know, because I, because songwriting was so important to me, like I'd write, write, write. And I also had like an element of that sport thing of commitment to training mm. and, you know, knowing what it takes to, to like, you know, we'd rehearse three, four times a week, more than the next band, you know what I mean? And like, it was like I, I, that, but, but ultimately it was, you know, like, you had to believe that because no one was giving you anything and no one thought you could do it. And everyone saw, you know, if anything, it was more people trying to drag you down than go, yay, you can do this. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, so, you, and, you, and, you know, being on the back of the bus, just getting, you know, destroyed with your guitar and just, you know, just, just all that, all those things. But, you know, if you have that in the back of your mind, if you have that, you know, you think of, think of that little walk you know what i mean you think of that little <laughs> just go fuck it man just just let's just go for this and just 
just get the, you know, I mean, it very much was that way. But then, you know, it was that way for the first, you know, two albums because, you know, you, you kind of, you don't know any, you don't know any other way, you know, once you, once you get there, you still got that fight and you still want to, you still got that like us against the world and you still have to have that confidence. Don't know where it comes from, but you have to believe. And then, you know, there's a time where, you know, maybe you have kids and that and you go, well, maybe I can't be that guy. Maybe I need to fucking figure this out, and turn that down a bit and <laughs> get confidence from another source. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. But I think like, you know, it's interesting you saying that even for the first couple of albums, because, you know, you had success pretty quickly, but then I guess like, is there a thing where if you're not from London, if you're not from that sort of thing, then even if you're being successful in the industry, then you feel a bit like, I don't know, like like you're sort of infiltrating in a different way. Like, did you find it hard sort of adjusting to like being in those situations as like, you know, four, four kids from Leicester who'd like yeah. wound up in like London uh, board meetings? I suppose. So. I mean, we, we tend to, tended to sort of like, the forefront really was 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 kind of we just we didn't take any of it very s seriously at all. It was all a, it was all like it was all just like you know it was just piss taking really. I mean, we honestly we just we just you know the music and the show were like there was no you know that was but but in terms of everything else you know it's preposterous. It's a, it's a stupid thing to do with your life. Do you know what I mean? So you kind of should act <laughs> that way. And there were times where, you know, people would, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because you get put in a box and it just, it just is what it is. And it's weird because I think what happens is you tend to sort of, rather than, you sort of, rather than trying to convince people, oh no, hold on, you got it wrong you sort of double down on what they think you are. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, these wild, I mean, you know, like we wild men, rock, all that bullshit. And we just, we go, yeah, that's exactly what we fucking are. And when we turned up anywhere, we, we lived it and we had it like proper, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, no sleep for days and just turn up places and just be obnoxious and be little shits, you know? And, and, but I think that was, I think we just kind of went, okay, well, if that's what you think we are, we'll fucking, well, that's what we'll be, you know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> but, it, but at the same time, you know, it was, there was no malice or cruelness in it. We were just having a laugh, you know what I mean? And we were just, we and it, and it was there very much, we kept in our own circle. Like we didn't let anyone in very tight. But I do miss that a little bit. Like when we go to festivals now, it's interesting because it's all very quiet, like back backstage, and it's play. It's great, you know what I mean. It's nice, but like we would literally, we'd take the biggest sound system anyone's ever created in history, you know, play rainforest noises, and you know what I mean, like to fucking do everyone's heads in, and just and get so <laughs> messed up, we'd just end up in people's dressing rooms, and you know what I mean, just had the most wildest times, and I don't see that anymore. I don't see that the young bands just kind of disheveled and do you know what I mean just kind yeah, of it's living it living it or a... just just it's different it's different yeah I think everyone is um I have way more conversations with bands these days about like self-care and all of that than uh <laughs> yeah. than the Great. sort of party Fine. side of things yeah. and you know there's there's space yeah. for both but I think absolutely um, absolutely I'm glad that there are bands that uh I remember, oh my God, I remember, I think I saw you at a festival once and you'd like brought in some absolutely enormous speaker system and everyone around you was complaining. I feel like that was also yeah, what a yeah. commitment to the bit to like have to schlep that <laughs> everywhere. Oh no, 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 it costs an absolute fortune. Like we, we, we take all take on less money because of this speaker, but, <laughs> but, 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 but for the times where Blink 182 security would knock on the door and go, Hey guys, the, you know, the guys from Blink 182 would like you to turn the music down. It's like, yeah, mate, that's exactly what we're going to do right now is turn the music down. I'm like, turn it fucking louder and then put some drum and bass on and just go, see you, mate. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. But it's, you just think, God, man, we're, we're like, 
you dedicated your life to art like what just you know like come on just like, have a just, laugh <laughs> just like just get in here get in here and you know what I mean pull up a chair and we'll, we'll go through it I'm in, I'm fascinated by people and their you know how they got there and uh, just go on, rather than complain get in here and we'll have a chat you know what I mean <laughs> Let's hash it out, Blink 182. Come on. Right. Come I mean, look at them. They're like, they, you know, they're covered in tattoo to have the music down. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that one has clearly stuck with you as a memory. Um, I do think it's interesting, though, what you were saying before about, um, like, the sort of discipline of having grown up doing football and how that sort of... Because I think in one way, like, I imagine, like, top, you know, when you're, like, training to be, like, top-level athlete, that's, like, you know, get sleep, eat well, exercise mm. every day, all that kind of stuff. Like, do you think... Yeah, um, did none of that. that. None yeah. of that. None of that part of it. Like, the opposite <laughs> of that. <laughs> the opposite of that. Is there a bit of you that sort of was that like good training though? In some ways, like oh yeah, really yeah, like, commit. It, it's more. It's, it's it, for me. It's the discipline of writing, like that. You know, like that would have helped. You know, I definitely. I'm, I'm on that tip now, for sure. But then, but but you know, but the you know back in the, you know the the you know the I don't know six seven albums, the discipline of like. You know, writing, that's the thing. Like, taking care of myself, that wasn't, a, that was just, that was, no, I didn't do that. But later on, I figured that out now. But it's just in terms of, like, writing is like, it's, it's getting up and committing to making an album and, you know, doing a record, going on tour and then back in the studio doing a record. You know, it's hard, man. Writing tunes is hard. Like, and, you know, you've got to, you know, you wake up and, you know, the days where you can't do it. And if you, if, if, if you sort of rate your life, rate your sort of happiness on whether you, your tunes are any good. Again, I figured that out. But back in the day, it's like, man, that is, you can have some dark days, you know, if you, it's not mm. there. And especially if you've, you know, like, you know, when I, when like, when I wrote like Fire and Underdog and, club for these big old tunes and then you've got to do it again and you know and then you've got a fan base that are waiting and and you want to kind of go down different avenues creative i just don't want to follow the same path but then you sort of think well i need to kind of i don't know i don't know sometimes you you can let the voices go oh yeah that doesn't sound like and then you go shit is that right so there's a lot of that going on but i think you know that sport background just i don't know it's like we we take this seriously you know the band is everything it's number one but you know every 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 decision is for the best of the band you know As well as the photos that you brought in, we asked you to bring in um, a song choice that represents some of these times that we've been speaking about. What song did you pick? You know what? I, I'm, I, I've gone for a Babe Ruth song called Broken Cloud. Okay. Um, and it's probably not what you'd expect, but I just it's just a, such an important record for me. It's so beautiful. And... Like it would get me out of monumental hangovers and monumental nights out, but I would always go to that song to just I don't know. It's the see this 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 the magic of music and like it can heal. You know what I'm saying? Like it can. Yeah. You know? Like when you feel like <laughs> shit, put a tune on, or when you feel like when you're out for a run, put a tune on, or before a gig, put a tune on, or it's sad. I don't know. It, you know that they they've tested. You know they've done neurological tests on people's brains and they listen to music, and it changes. You know it changes you chemically, which is sort of insane. Like, and that's and this song has that ability just to go. It's just so beautiful and like it just emo like I love emotional music. Like whether that's a heavy riff 
that just makes you want to run through walls or whether it's a song like this that you literally could bring you to tears, you know. And I, I, I chose that because this one, hearing this like sort of uh, early 20s, just going, wow, music, there, there's music out there that sounds like this. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. you know. And then it, then it, it just kind of, what I love about when you hear things that then you start exploring that, that world and, you know, and you, you go from sort of being obsessed with like, you know, suicide and Iggy Pop and you think that's the end. And then you find something like this and go, Oh shit, what's this door? And then you go through that door and then you go on that journey for a bit. And then there's another door. And I, cause I, I'm, I'm just obsessed with learning new things and, uh, uh you know, I think that's the, the thing, this, this track opened a door at an age where I was, I was in this place and it's like, Oh, there's this kind of shit going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How would you be like discovering music at that time? Was that sort of through like friends, record collections or just like crate digging in shops? Yeah. Yeah. So I got, a, I had a really good pal called Dan Martin, who's, you know, when I did SLP he played and he was like a, we sort of connected like musically, he he had like decks and he DJ, and he was sort of that into the hip hop world. So he sort of he sort of introduced me to like going to there was an arches underneath um, Leicester railway station mm -hmm. where you would dig for loops and and beats. It's amazing. And then there was a there was an actual crap rock uh, record store opposite the train station. So you'd sort of spend your weekend Saturday going down digging for a few um digging and then yeah uh, and it, and finding something n new was like i mean it's weird now because although i've got I, you know I, I can find anything i want which is sort of amazing but then i don't know it's hard to it's hard to compare because at the time everything was new so everything's way more exciting anyway but you did have to work hard you had to work hard to find the to find the, the drum loop was fucking hard, man. And that's why no one did it, because it was like, whereas now you can just type in 100 best drum loops and there they are. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. Yeah, I sort of think that like um, it's almost in a weird way. Sometimes I find it harder now because like there would be avenues before where it's like, <laughs> oh, you know, a band would reference something that they loved and then you mm. go back to that and then maybe they'd be uh playing a gig with someone else and then you go and there was like quite a sort of like direct yeah. chain of like you know seven oh, degrees really? of separation whereas mm -hmm. now i sort of think like ah, like where do you even yes yes start? where do you even begin yeah are you still you quite begin? sort of like you're still i mean i get the vibe that you're still someone that kind of like seeks out a lot of new oh, yeah, stuff yeah. and is still very yeah, yeah. kind of like in tune with with things. Totally, totally. That that, that yeah. In fact, that's probably more. I'm listening to more new music now than than I ever have because I feel that's kind of the most exciting thing about the medium in which we listen to music now on the streamers is although it's weird because catalog music is bigger than ever, but a new music's kind of suffering from that. But I'm kind of finding it more exciting to find new stuff um, because it's so easy to just, you know, spend an hour just going, right, I'm going to give an hour just to go, right, what's out there? What's new? What's popping now? Have you got any new finds that you've been loving? I like really like this kid called Masterpiece. He's really oh, good. Yeah, I, he's good. I think that's really good. Would it be Big Special or something like that? Yeah. Is that what it's called? That is a band. Yeah, that's them. Yeah, that that yeah. was good. I I enjoyed that big special. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. That was they good. just headlined a DIY tour, so no way. Taste it. If if I'd have known you liked it, we could have. Uh, oh, got, that's got awesome! You down to Look the at show. that. I didn't even listen. I'm not even. That's 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 <laughs> great. There you go. We'll we'll leave it there. There we go. We'll leave that there. Um, but yeah, Babe Ruth. I don't really know anything about Babe Ruth. What sort of um paint paint a picture for me? So beautiful, like seventies, like really, uh, like uh, it's sort of funky. It's just got that sound. The famous one they did is the Mexican that um, mm. Liam Howlett used um, on the Dust Chamber sessions. Um, but it's got you know, 
yeah, it, it, it's very cinematic as well. So for, for, I feel like they owe a lot to Morricone and stuff, but it's got that, it's got a dry, like the rhythms are ridiculous. They're so good. Yeah. Was that um, sort of coming into your life at a certain, can you pinpoint like why it was that that sort of music was like resonating with you at the time? I loved, I, I mean, so I loved like hip hop was, was I really sort of got deep into hip hop like, like that era, late teens, early twenties. And DJ Shadow was definitely like, I loved that hybrid of the flavor like hip hop production, but then he was using old records, psychedelic records. And so that, that had a huge effect. So it was just trying to find where these samples were coming from. And that was kind of the, the sort of the next journey of like, Oh, what this is great, but where are they getting the, where are they getting those noises from? You know what I mean? Mm. So that was definitely like going down that road to just to, to find out where sort of, analyze where they were getting their sounds from and why that was why that was sounding so dusty and just had that you know crunch was that around the sort of time like i mean i guess that would be sort of early years of yeah to that sort of yeah maybe like night 90 99 2000 2001 but i was really into that period as well i was really into warp like that that um you know, that, that had a real big impact. I, I just absolutely loved that label. I was obsessed with, mm -hmm. just thought it was just, it was just the future that, you know what I'm saying? You just listen to that and you go, what the fuck is any of this? It's just <laughs> so wild. <laughs> and and they just tended, they just found these like, you know, like obviously had Aphex and Two Lone Swordsman and you just had these like square pusher. And it's just, what and I, there was an element of them, you know, like it was so, like I felt like a synergy with that. Like there was a little bit of piss taken about it as well because some of it was so ridiculous, and that you just think, "Now nah, these are having it off," but it's like beautiful because then, and it was also music that would freak people out. I love that old Tetra. You know what I'm saying? You play it at a party and everyone go, "Oh, get this off! This is awful." <laughs> Speakers are broke. You're like, "Yeah, can love that." <laughs> and, and and that label was just so on it, and you know that that that. The artwork, everything about it was just like, wow, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. Is there an alternate world where if you hadn't have started Kasabian, you would have ended up being like a sort of face twin type, like a hundred percent. His commitment, his, 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 his commitment to, 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 <laughs> to, to being the narkiest person in the world is fucking unbelievable. I, there's so many amazing, I, I like it. It was. I I heard that he drove around in a secure van. I, I I was you know like the 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 vans that tr to transfer yeah, the money yeah. from. That he had one of the you know like he lived in an old bank and he had one of those cars. I mean it was amazing the, the mythology surrounding. Yeah, it. I thought that um, he was meant to live in that um, building in the middle of Elephant and Castle Roundabout. That was the rumor <laughs> that I heard. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I was in. I was just. I was loved that. But yeah, no, there, there would have been. Yeah, if like. I have a, there's definitely a part of me that is super introverted and would just be like to just get on a laptop and just make strange little music. But then there was a bigger part of me that has this just love for connection on a massive scale and, and being part of, you know, being part of nights out where, you know, there's thousands of people all just getting into the same thing at the same time. I think it's so incredible. Like those early raves, I just, you know, that I think that 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 really affected me. Just that these kids just like figuring it out. Like we'll just get a, we'll get a tent. We'll, it, you know, there's no just there's a, that legal rave scene was just massive. And then obviously the, you know. That just seeing those like Woodstock and just going, yeah, I, I, I want that's that's what I want to. There's something about that that I can't shake, and I don't, not that I want to shake, but it's just, that's in me, you know, that just to be part of big things, you know what I mean? And and even though at my core, I'm in, like a proper introvert, really, but then there's another guy that just 
sort of every now and again elbows his way in and goes, no, nah, no, nah, get your fur coat on, you dickhead. We've got to, we've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> we've got to get this. We've got to sort this out. <laughs> The last thing that we asked you to bring in is an object of your choosing. What object mm. was that choice? Well, so I think it would have been like early 2000s. We were asked, we got, it was our first sort of feature and, in, and it was and in the enemy, it was a massive deal. And they picked 10 bands um, to that they were going to be big that year, you know, you know, and mm. I, I can remember some of them. There was us, there was a band called the ordinary boys. Of course. Uh, Keen, Keen, one of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't, and then the Paddington's maybe. Anyway, I brought in a, uh, I, my, I had a little, um, like a little antique sort of ornament with all my baby teeth in it. I thought <laughs> I'm taking that. So I'm going to choose that for this because because I because I feel like that was the first thing I thought of when you when you asked me to bring something in. <laughs> I mean, a a stunning answer, the greatest one that we've had. <laughs> what did you do? So wait a minute. So you somehow managed to work these baby teeth into the photo shoot? Yeah, yeah. I just I just that you had to hold. You know, you had to hold the object you brought in. I mean, obviously, other bands they brought in like posters of fucking radiohead and shit i was like nah mate that's not for me that that's <laughs> come on we're better than that so you know the, yeah yeah so so i but so i think i feel like on that basis that it's right that they make another appearance it's just yeah. beautiful it's like a weird sort of floral like plastic thing with a you know pan painted flowers on it and then you unscrew the top and there's about 10 little teeth in it have you ever been tempted to do i've actually got a pot of baby teeth on my shelf as well yes um, see? And- <laughs> see they're not it's not that crazy is it like there's people can relate to that right <laughs> it's relatable content uh, <laughs> um, but I honestly think, people oh, listening to this turn people listening to this will go i've got a pot of baby teeth i swear i have in an old camera film case somewhere. In, right? in an old box. Yeah, exactly. This is what, you know what? People <laughs> think that you have to write Ed Sheeran, but actually you just need to, the relatable content is in the baby teeth. This is what... Uh, exactly. This is exactly. what it's all about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've always wondered, like, have you ever been tempted to turn them into something? I always think maybe I'll make them into like a necklace mm. or some sort of weird jewellery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I have thought. I have thought about it because I do my art. Like I've got this, I have a sort of, I don't know what you'd call it. Like a, I go under the name of Daft Apis from, and I do my art under that. And I'm loving that actually. I'm, I'm sort of in the middle of sorting out another show. But I do think, I don't, I don't you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure whether I could get permission to sort of use them, but I do think about them a fair bit that would look nice on a canvas something somehow <laughs> arranged. Definitely. <laughs> What sort of thing is Daft Apeth making? It, it, all sorts. I did a show. I mean, there's so much, like from, you know, ceramics to um, prints to, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, Thai. I mean, just anything I could get my hands on, I sort of draw. And I just, it, it, it was just, it's a nice way of making something really quickly because songs are, songs are hard and they take time and they are like, yeah. Like, and there's sometimes you can get lucky in 10 minutes and you can have, you know, and they're usually the best ones, but a lot of the time it's, it's, it's a, you know, as a process, it's really hard. And the first idea, like the first riff, that's the, that's the adrenaline kick. And then the rest of it is not, you know what I mean? It's graft, it's proper process and writing, but, with my art, I can do things really quickly and have a finished piece. So I get the same kick, but it's kind mm-hmm. of done. So I'm working mm-hmm. on my iPad or painting. It's like, ah, oh, that. So, so if I'm having a slow day in the studio, I just try and make a bit of art. So it's like, well, I've done, you know, I feel good. I've done something, you know. So that's been a really nice thing. And it's kind of, you know, but like from the name, I, it's silly. I can just be silly. And I, I, I'm very, you know, there's, you know, like, 
I love I love fucking about and being silly. I love it. No. <laughs> I haven't had, had got that vibe from the whole of this conversation. <laughs> Is that something where are you and Noel Fielding still sort of uh, ever talking about doing more collaborative stuff together? Yeah, always. Yeah. Yeah. We always we always have to, you know, we have good hour conversations. It's quite it's quite old fashioned, like you know, like when you do, you know, like when you'd use the phone at home, right? And and <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like you could go, you could go deep with a mate for like an hour. Like we have a good old hour chat. Um, and yeah, there's there's all there's the three or four ideas that are always circulating. But I think you know we just have one man. We just you know those sort of but you know those old school belly laughs where you just can't you know you you don't get them so much when you get older. <laughs> where you, but when you literally go fucking stop looking at me because I can't stop that. Like I cannot stop this. It's like corpsing, like an amazing, you know, when you see like an, an amazing sort of outtake where they can't get through a scene and they mm. just look at each other. And it's like, and it, and, it, and it gets worse and worse and worse. So there's a lot of that going on, which that's <laughs> and like it. That that sense of humor, man, is so like I I I. I fucking love laughing man so it's like so he's just like my favorite person because we just go go down some weird avenue <laughs> he has absolutely got a pot of baby teeth on his shelf as well like 100% oh, God, yeah. that man has. yeah he's already made he's already done an art show on that for sure man. jesus <laughs> oh but i feel like maybe that's a good place <laughs> wind this up um but one nice. thing we've been asking everyone at the end of these podcasts um is if the guy in the photo if like 16 17 year old Serge was to look at his life now what do you think he'd be the most pleased about that has come to pass oh wow um i mean definitely he'd be happy that he, that i was that was i was alive you know what i mean he'd be like yeah that's that's a positive um <laughs> And he'd definitely go, shit, man. No, I think he'd be sort of like, you know, there wasn't like, although the dreams were big back then, but, but, but as big as we dared to dream was just getting signed and making a record, you know, and that, that would have been, that would have been it, you know, that would have been like, yeah, you, you stat, that would have been good enough. Do you know what I mean? Like, wow, you fucking made a record, but to be this far down the line of, of written, like, you know, eight nine records and still still be kind of like you know in the game you know what I mean? still yeah, man. be be headlining, like headlining headlining yeah festivals, headlining, headlining festivals and, and 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 still kind of staying true to the to the to your art and not backing down and not playing to the crowd and just doing your own thing being that person i think you'd be like shit yeah that's pretty great nice one mate was Serge Pizzorno of Kasabian, a man with a lot of bangers to his name and a small box of baby teeth. Um, he will be headlining Latitude alongside the rest of the band on July the 26th. Before that, there will be the huge Leicester Victoria Park homecoming show that is on July the 6th. And that's the day after their new album Happenings is released into the world. And it is unsurprisingly full of absolutely massive tunes um thank you to Serge for joining us on the podcast i think we can all agree that Serge is a treat and if you liked listening to this podcast why not go back and listen to some of the previous episodes of before they knew better we have had absolutely loads of brilliant guests on we have had the likes of lauren mabry of churches we have had c matt we have had bill Ryder jones just like last week um oh no two weeks ago kate nash last week uh everything everything the cribs pele from the hives literally just loads of people um so you can go back and dig into all of those if you give us a subscribe then the next episodes will come direct into your podcast inbox on a tuesday morning while you're at it why not give the may issue of 
of DIY Magazine Read. That is fronted by Rachel Chinariri and it has loads of other brilliant artists inside. And keep your eye out for our newest issue, which is landing in a mere matter of days. But yes, so give us a like, give us a subscribe, give us a review if you fancy it, only if it's nice. And we will see you next Tuesday for the next episode of Before They Knew Better with DIY Magazine.